先生们，大家好，我叫黄超，在日内瓦大学公司工作，可是我的中文呃不太好，所以我要我发音发音，行吧？我说发音一些，啊，然后啊，我们可以可以啊，英文好吗？So I'm excited to be here. Excited to tell you about uh, what we are doing for uh, co-making in, in my city, Geneva, Geneva, Switzerland. It's a very small city compared to Shenzhen. Only a few percent of the population of Shenzhen, but it's quite a famous city. It's famous for several things. It's famous for very expensive watches. Rolex. No, I don't have a Rolex. Maybe you have a Rolex. It's famous for very expensive chocolate. I love it, yeah. Uh, uh, and, but it, it's also famous for private banks where very rich people can, uh, you know, put their money and then buy expensive watches, expensive chocolate. <laughs> but Geneva is famous for something else, completely different. It's famous for making peace. It's famous for bringing the nations of the world together to solve problems together uh, and, and stop war. And, and it's famous for that for many historical reasons. And I just want to briefly uh, mention some. Do you know this symbol? Who recognizes this symbol? Huh? Probably nobody, because it represents an organization that no longer exists called the League of Nations. The League of Nations was started just after the First World War. It was the vision of the leaders of uh, many nations how to prevent that there should ever be another world war on our planet. Uh, it was a time of great optimism. This is 100 years ago, actually, that, that that war ended. And one year later, the League of Nations was created. And for a while, they solved many problems. But after a while, things didn't work out so well. So in 1936, this is a picture from the League of Nations uh, in Geneva, so they settled in Geneva, and that was the beginning of Geneva becoming a very international city. And here is a picture of the Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia. He is complaining to the League of Nations because the year before, Italy, under the fascist leader Mussolini, invaded Ethiopia. And you know, one year later, 1937, the Japanese invaded China. It was a great catastrophe. And one year later, Germany invaded and annexed Austria and Czechoslovakia. And one year later, 1939, a Second World War begins. So the League of Nations failed. But already at the end of the Second World War, even before it finishes, nations got together and they created version 2.0, which everybody knows today, the United Nations. And the United Nations, of course, the headquarters is in New York, but actually, many of the agencies and a lot of the activity is still in Geneva, where the League of Nations started. This is the Palace of Nations. It was created for the League of Nations. It's now the Geneva headquarters of the United Nations. At the time it was built, it was the second biggest building by volume in the whole world. Only the Palace of Versailles was bigger. It shows how much Switzerland, a neutral country, wanted to support peace in the world. So today, if you visit Geneva, there are hundreds of international organizations and NGOs all over part of the city that we call the International Geneva. Actually, it's one of the most international cities in the world. Almost 50% of the population is from somewhere else. Here's a few statistics. There are dozens of international organizations in Geneva, hundreds of NGOs, tens of thousands of people are employed in that. That's roughly 10% of all the jobs in Geneva directly in the international uh, activity in Geneva. But I said Geneva is very small, so 10% of Geneva is actually also small. And it's a reminder to all of us, you know, the United Nations is very famous, very prestigious, and everybody thinks United Nations is so powerful, but actually it's so small. There's so much, uh, to give you an idea, uh, roughly the budget every year, three billion. Huh? The U.S. Department of Commerce, a budget about uh, uh, 14 billion dollars, and maybe 40,000 people just in one department. I'm sure one ministry in China is bigger than most of the UN. 
right? So, in perspective, the UN is small and fragile and needs help. Because guess what? We are living in a period again where there is a challenge to this approach of international peacemaking, where there seems to be a lot of concern about maybe things breaking down again. So, a year and a half ago, the United Nations launched a, a new campaign, how to get the whole world to solve some of the problems that are creating tensions between nations. It's called the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, right? These are 17 goals for the whole planet. Uh, we want to, oh, sorry. We want to uh, reduce poverty, reduce hunger, but also more, e more equality between men and men, women, sustainable cities. We want to solve the problems of pollution in the oceans, on land. It's a very, very ambitious program for the whole planet. And I just emphasize here that one of the key goals is partnership. We have to work together, private sector, public sector, academia, international organizations. Otherwise, we never solve all these problems. We have 15 years to do this. This is a challenge for 2030. Let's see how far we can get. So for us in Geneva, at the University of Geneva, we saw this as a great time to bring together the maker spirit, a maker world, with this grand global challenges. Um, and just to give you an idea, these, although these challenges sound very abstract, and you know, you think, how can I help? It's not clear. Behind each challenge, there is uh, some very concrete targets, uh, such as this one, for reducing the global maternal mortality. And for, for all these targets, there are very quantitative goals or indicators. So there are quantitative things that need to be measured, and there are targets that need to be achieved. And th this is a space where we need technology, we need, need new solutions. Because actually, and the United Nations admits this, for many of the things we need to measure for the SDGs, we don't have the technology yet even to measure it. Maybe one third of the goals, the indicators, we don't know how to do it. And even when we do know how to do it, we often only have very expensive equipment that doesn't scale to use in all parts of the world, even in, in developing and quite poor countries. Also, being able to measure change is one thing, but then we also need to make change. We need to actually find methods to achieve the targets. And then, really important, when we make a breakthrough and we want to change the world, we have to be humble, we have to be able to assess, you know, uh, is what we are doing, is it really having the impact we want? And is it maybe having some negative impacts as well? We need to be able to assess this. So these are the SDG challenges we have. So to tackle this, we created a, an SDG solution space, a maker space, right in the heart of international Geneva. Um, and here I show you uh, on a plan of Geneva, you see uh, right here is our, our maker space and it's right next to the World Trade Organization, the Palace of Nations, here's the UN High Commission for Refugees. So all these international organizations, they can just walk across the street to our maker space, and they do. People come, they have coffee, they discuss projects with our students, and then they work on these projects together. So, so these are projects that, that, uh, that we uh, carry out at the University of Geneva and the Tsinghua University as part of something called the Geneva Tsinghua Initiative. I'll come back to that in a second. Here is the uh, SDG solution space. It's just an old archive space. And here is a, you know, a key person from the United Nations telling our students about challenges. You know, they may come back from like World Health Organization. They go out to very challenging places, a bit like Andy here, uh, but there may be Ebola and they see, wow, how can we solve this problem? Maybe we need some new measuring technique. They come back, and, but they don't know how to do that. They are not technologists. They don't know the solutions. And so we get our students to, to talk to them and then think about solutions. And I'd like to emphasize one thing here. Our students are from all kinds of backgrounds. Some are engineers, some are scientists, but some are political scientists. Some are uh, psychologists. Some have a background in uh, business, and we think that it's very important to mix these backgrounds because the solution is not complete unless you think of all the dimensions. Sometimes you don't need technology. You need just to change a policy, or you need to change the psychology of a community 
so that they behave in a different way. So that's why we call it a solution space. It's more, in a sense, than a maker space. So we emphasize team-based solutions with teams of interdisciplinary students. We are very influenced by the famous uh, psychologist uh, Piaget, Jean Piaget. He was a professor at the University of Geneva for 50 years. He opened up the field of child development psychology and he said one such an important thing. He said, you know, to really learn something, you have to try and solve a problem that nobody has solved already. In our universities, in Europe and China, I think we're always challenged because we're always trying to solve problems. Our professor already knows the solution. Here in the solution space, we're trying to solve problems where nobody knows the solution. That makes the students so, so much more eager and, and work harder. But of course, they have ideas that's not always good, so there has to be feedback, there has to be you know, criticism, and we bring in experts from the United Nations to, to review what our students do. This man is the Director General of the United Nations in Geneva. He comes into our makerspace to talk to the students and hear about their solutions. It's really cool to be in a place where we can interact like this with the international community. So the Geneva Tsinghua Initiative, it's a vision for uh, really solving the problems of the SDGs with challenge-based learning. We want to do high-impact projects, mentorship by experts from the international organizations, and we are connecting partners in Geneva and in China. Why China? There's a few reasons. Uh, one is with Tsinghua University, uh, we have, Tsinghua has a main campus in Beijing, but it has also an amazing graduate campus here in Shenzhen uh, that does very good uh, challenge-based programs such as Open Fiesta. And we want to collaborate here in Shenzhen on technology, on the, the latest techniques that we can use uh, for, for making solutions to the SDGs. Another reason to be frank, is that China is a model for the future of sustainable development. This country is trying to become more sustainable in energy, in the environment. And if China can succeed, it will give hope to many other nations around the world. If China doesn't succeed, we are all in trouble. Okay, so we have many education activities that we have set up in the last two years. We have a, a master's program, two years, one in Geneva, one at Tsinghua. Uh, you get a Master of Science and a Master of Public Administration. We have a summer school that lasts two months in Geneva, Beijing, and Shenzhen. Uh, we have an innovation exchange for professionals who are doing social innovation to learn about international Geneva and about uh, the innovations going on in China. We have an SDG accelerator where we help student teams that have a great idea go a little bit further towards a demo where they can get startup funding or start an NGO. We have hackathons that we do throughout the city. Uh, once a year, maybe a thousand people are involved in 30 hackathons around Geneva, with International Geneva. And we have online coaching of student projects called the Open 17 Challenge. And if you join the Open 17 Challenge, any student from anywhere on the planet can join. You can then uh, win a place in our summer school, maybe go on to the master's program. This is a program for everyone, not just Geneva, not just China, it's for the whole world. What sort of challenges are we talking about? Well, here's one example from, from this summer. Our students were working with the World Health Organization and the International Telecommunications Union on six challenges related to mobile health, a program called Be Healthy, Be Mobile. Everything from how to encourage people to wear helmets when they ride a bicycle or a motorcycle. It's a big problem in China, right? And you don't want to wear a helmet, but actually the accidents that are caused by not wearing a helmet it's a very serious health issue for your whole country. Uh, crowdsourcing tobacco control, making people uh, aware that they should not smoke in certain areas uh, where the government has said that there's no smoking. Getting children in schools to lead, lead healthier lives, and so on and so forth. Detection techniques for early stage cancer, for diabetes, for hypertension. So our students work on these projects, and just to give you one example, this is a, a project that started in a hackathon it was then in the summer school. You can see, actually, these are some of our students meeting people from all over Shenzhen at the Shenzhen Open Innovation Lab. And the, the project was all about how to help blind people to go from A to B in their city using a belt. And in the belt, there's a haptic sensor that are haptic uh, 
uh, actuators that tell them which direction to go. So combining some advanced software for getting exact directions of sidewalks and crosswalks uh, with this belt. And we've been uh, working on this for a while. We now work with Seed Studio on studying how to industrialize this because that's very important. It's great to have a good idea, but then you have to think how to make it cheaply enough that it's accessible to blind people, not only in Switzerland, but in China and other countries. So we're so excited to be working with the infrastructure and ecosystem here in Shenzhen uh, on these projects. But you know, it's not enough for just some students in Geneva and China and others who join. We need makers around the world to help with the SDGs. We really need to connect. I want to remind you again, the SDG 17 partnerships we really need to collaborate. This week, I spent the whole week with an amazing group of people at something called Bosch, the Gathering for Open Science Hardware. Like a hundred uh, people, like a hundred Andes, women and men who do crazy things with technology for science and sometimes invent things that could be really important for sustainable development. Bosch is an example of how to partner across the world. We're also launching this uh, network of labs called United Labs for Global Goals here in Shenzhen, in, in Africa, in India, in North America. These labs have one thing in common. They will share their space with students working on SDG projects so the students can do the project in the best possible place for their project. So if you want to know more about the Geneva Qinghao Island Initiative, the SDG Solution Space, the, the link is there. These are some of our students from China and around the world in front of the Palace of Nations. Um, sometimes, you know, in the UN, you think about it, it's like a lot of people talking in big meeting rooms like this, right? And I think uh, the challenge now for all of us, for all makers, is we have to stop talking about making a better planet we have to just make it. Thank you.